to uh, introduce today's speaker, Professor Klaus Blanc from uh, Max Blanc Institute for Nuclear Physics. And uh, uh, it's my great honor to introduce Klaus Blanc to you. He studies uh, at uh, Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. After receiving his PhD, he worked as a postdoctor uh, for the uh, GSI at the um, European Organization for Nuclear Research CERN in uh, Geneva. From 2004 to 2007, he was leader of the Homeport uh, Research Group in Mainz, where he uh, habilitated in 2006. At the age of only uh, 35, uh, um, 35 years, he was appointed um, uh, director for the Department of Stored and Cooled Ions at uh, the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg and as a professor and faculty member of the Department of Physics and uh, Astronomy at uh, uh, University of uh, Heidelberg University. For his uh, groundbreaking research, Klaus Braun was awarded numerous prizes, including the uh, matthaus Herzog Prize in 2005 uh, of German Society for Mass uh, Spectrometry, uh, Blairworth Prize in 2013, uh, the Lisa Maintainer Prize for Nuclear Physics of European Physical Society in 2020, and also, uh, and also Otto Hahn Prize in, I think, 2021. Uh, he has been a fellow of the American Physical Society since 2008 and a member of the Royal Sweden, Swedish Academy of Science since 2019. Klaus Braun, uh, Klaus Braun since, uh, on July, uh, 1st, uh, 2020, Klaus Braun uh, becomes as the new scientific vice uh, president for the chemistry, physics, and the technologies section of the uh, Max Planck Society. Okay, uh, today, uh, uh, let's welcome uh, uh, Klaus Planck to, to give the talk. So, time is yours, Klaus. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Bing Sheng, and uh, let me try to share my screen. Still a close uh, collaborating and I'm very much looking forward, Bing Sheng, to visit you either end of this year or latest next year. So uh, since this is a colloquium in the series of Frontier of Nuclear Physics, I decided to change a little bit the title of your colloquium series to Precision Frontier of Nuclear Physics, which describes uh, rather well the work we are doing here in Heidelberg, namely on precision tests of fundamental interactions and their symmetries using exotic ions and penning graphs. And I will give a very broad introduction first to the motivation and the fields of applications. We'll then move on to the basics of penning graph spectroscopy. And then I will give numerous recent results and future perspectives of this research field. Let me start with a motivation from the field of nuclear physics. What you see here is a kind of an artist's view. Let's see if I get uh, the pointer. Yes, laser pointer. So you see here kind of an artist's view. It's the nuclear landscape where the binding energy per nucleon is plotted. So the black dots are the stable species in the nuclear chart. And if you go to the left or to the right, you will reach the proton and neutron trip lines. Of course, if you go to the very heavy mass region, you will reach the so-called island of stability of the super heavy elements. What we are interested in is the fine structure of this nuclear mass surface by measuring the masses of short-lived radioactive species and to get a hint on nuclear structure effects like uh, magic numbers, uh, shell closures, and so on. And of course, to test most modern nuclear mass models. Another application comes from the field of astrophysics and neutrino physics, and I will um, give a few examples of where we have contributed to the nuclear physics, uh, to the neutrino physics research, by the measurement of the mass difference of the mother and daughter nucleus. You will also see that we have reached, meanwhile, uncertainties that allows us even to measure atomic binding energies. And the last example I would like to highlight here as a field of application is uh, fundamental interactions and their symmetries, most notably the symmetry of the charged periodic time reversal symmetry, but also the measurement of fundamental constants, as you will see uh, during my presentation. And here, this is not meant too seriously, but I like to give this as an appetizer. Namely, what we have in mind with tests of symmetries, you see here an, an Escher painting where the particle is my black or my dark horse and the antiparticle is my yellowish horse. 
And now I let run the experiment. I hope you can see that in the animation that now this uh, slide is moving. And now I would like to apply a first symmetry operation. And the first symmetry operation is, is parity. So I simply put a mirror here at the position of P, and I hope you can agree that this right image is now the mirror image of the left one. Uh, Bing Sheng, can you confirm that you see the moving of this image? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Wonderful, great. Wonderful, great. So this is, this is a parity symmetry, simply by putting a mirror here at the red line. The next symmetry operation we know from physics is the charge conjugation. So you make it from a negatively charged particle to a positively charged particle. Since charge conjugation is difficult to show, I call C here now the color conjugation. So exactly at this blue line here, we change the color from this uh, dark horse to the yellowish horse and vice versa here from the yellowish horse to the dark horse. And last but not least, in order to get our full uh, symmetry operations, we have to run the experiment backwards which is called time reversal symmetry, the T operator. And if I do that here, I hope you agree once more. So while here the dark horse is moving forward, here it's moving backward, and the same with the yellowish horse. And now amazingly, if you compare the first image with the very last image, you see that they are, that they are identical, except that there is a one row shift. If you, sh if you shift this first image by one row down, you get exactly the last image. And that's in fact what CPT uh, symmetry holds. There's also a pi shift in. And of course, we do not compare Azure images, rather we compare the properties of matter and antimatter, specifically of a proton and an antiproton. And you will see our latest results on the CPT symmetry tests. So atomic and nuclear spectroscopy probes fundamental physics. And you see here a selection of questions which we are uh, which we want to answer by our experiments. The first one is how heavy are the building blocks of matter? And here specifically, we have put world record measurements on the table on measurement of the proton, the electron, and even the neutron mass. Why is there more matter than antimatter? That's of course uh, uh, one of the most fundamental questions which might be associated with a failure of the symmetry, CPT symmetry. And we want to test that as well. What is the mass of a neutrino? One of the most uh, important questions right now in uh, particle physics or astroparticle physics. We know from neutrino oscillations that neutrinos must have a rest mass, at least one of the three generations. And uh, what the rest mass is, is not known. And last but not least, this is a topic which we, uh, uh, which we would like to address in collaboration, for example, with the GSI in Darmstadt, but also with uh, Bing Sheng Tu uh, from Fudan University. And he has done several experiments at my institute here, namely the question, does quantum electrodynamics fail in the strong field regime, which we call bound state quantum electrodynamics. And I will give a few examples here as well, what we have reached as tests of QED predictions. The uh, sources which we are interested in, which we are using, and I mentioned it in my title, namely exotic species. And here specifically what we have in mind are radionuclides at radioactive ion beam facilities, short-lived species, which allows us to probe, for example, all the fundamental nuclear physics questions, which I've mentioned at the beginning. We are using antimatter and the protons to test CPT. And for the QED tests, we are using highly charged ions. And all three of them needs to be produced artificially since they do not naturally exist on Earth. Let me start with uh, an introduction on the nuclear mass measurements and uh, what we are interested in. You see here a simple sketch of an, uh, of an atom, which is comprised out of uh, the nucleus of a certain number of protons and neutrons. So n neutrons set protons and then set electrons. And the atomic mass is simply given by the masses of its constituents minus the binding energy. That's because of Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. The binding energy, here we have to distinguish between the nuclear binding energy, which is typically in the order of a few MeV per nucleon. And uh, you can probe nuclear binding energies with uh, relative mass measurements at the level of 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8. Why is that so? Well, let's assume an atomic mass of 100 atomic mass units. That's roughly 100 GeV. So I like to, to uh, transfer it always to an energy scale. So 
100 U is about 100 GeV. Binding energies, nuclear binding energies are on the order of few hundred keV to MeV. So uh, a 10 to the minus six measurements gives you an uncertainty of about 100 keV, 10 to the minus eight of about one keV to 10 keV uncertainty. That is sufficient to probe uh, the nuclear binding energy. The atomic binding energy, which is the binding energy of the electron bound to the nucleus is much, much smaller. Let's take as an example, the hydrogen atom where the electron is bound to the proton with 13.6 electron volts. So that's one GeV or 13.6 electron volts out of one GeV. And it immediately becomes obvious that in order to probe atomic binding energies, you need relative mass uncertainties of below 10 to the minus 10. And uh, right at this moment, there are only two groups in the world that can achieve that among the one here at my institute, at the Nuclear Physics Institute in Heidelberg. And I will give a few examples where we have demonstrated uncertainties, even in the range of 10 to the minus 12 for the uh, relative mass uncertainty. The working horse in our case is the so-called penning graph. It's a superposition of a strong magnetic field and the weak electrostatic potential. An ion with a charge to mass ratio Q over M can be confined in a strong magnetic field. Strong means here typically four to seven Tesla field strength. The ion reveals an oscillatory motion because the Lorentz force equals the centrifugal force. And like that, you have stored the particle here in the radial plane. The ion can still escape along the magnetic field lines. And in order to avoid that, we superimpose a weak electrostatic potential. Weak means here typically a 10 volt difference between the end cap and the ring electrodes. And that allows us to have a three dimensional confinement. The ion trajectory is a little bit more complicated as it is depicted here in this left image. It's a superposition of three independent harmonic eigenmotions. It's first the axial oscillation because of this uh, trapping potential, which we refer to as nu set. And then you have a modified cyclotron motion because you get now a so-called E cross B drift term, which uh, provides you with a macrotron motion. So we have a slow macrotron drift with the frequency nu minus and the fast modi modified cyclotron frequency around the magnetic field lines called nu plus. And the typical sketch of a penning grab, this is a hyperbolical penning grab, is here shown to the right, with hyperbolically shaped ring electrodes and end cap electrodes, holes for injection and ejection. But nowadays, we typically use cylindrical electrodes because they are easier to machine with uh, a precision that allows us to have an almost perfect field adjustment. The fr uh, frequency that we are interested in is, in fact, the true cyclotron frequency in EC given by the charge to mass ratio of the ion times the magnetic field strength B. And here, that's the, the um, beauty of our experiments. In order to extract the ionic mass, you simply have to measure the cyclotron frequency and have to know the magnetic field B. So it's a rather easy measurement. But of course, to measure the uh, mass down to the level of 10 to the minus 10 and better, of course, also requires the knowledge of the magnetic field to 10 to the minus 10 and better. And that's uh, what complicates the experiment because you first have to calibrate the magnetic field strength. You might have noticed that in this plot here, there is no new C. There are three frequencies, but none of them corresponds to new C because of the modified magnetic field. However, there is an easy relationship, which is referred to as the invariance theory, where the sum of the square of the three indiv individual frequencies gives you, if you take the square root, gives you the true cyclotron frequency nu C. So in fact, what we are doing in our experiments is that we have to measure three frequencies and we are doing so in a non-destructive manner using the Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance detection technique, which I'm going to introduce next. This is now a top view. The green particle is my ion that oscillates here in the, in the penning graph. This is the ring electrode fourfold segmented because that allows us to measure the induced image current, which is a very, very tiny image current that gets induced in the ring electrodes and that can be picked up with a resonance circuit. You see here an impedance that is attached to uh, two segments of the ring electrode. And you have, because of charge conservation, you have here a flow of the electrons. And then in resonance, this impedance becomes a real resistor and you can measure the voltage drop 
across this impedance, and that is given here. So the voltage drop as a function of time. And then if you apply the Fourier transformation, then you obtain the frequency spectrum. And that's exactly what we are interested in. Keep in mind that the induced image current is very small. It's about one femtoampere. The parallel resistor is in the order of 10 mega ohm to 100 mega ohm. And then you get the voltage drop in the order of uh, yeah, 100 nanovolt or so. That requires very sophisticated uh, detection electronics, which we are uh, developing ourselves. You see here the, uh, the coil, a cylindrical coil made out of niobium, titanium, superconducting wire. You see here our amplifiers also developed within our group. These are low noise cryogenic amplifiers operated at four Kelvin temperature based on gallium azonite field effect transistors with very low voltage noise and current noise, current noise in the order of one femtoom per square root hertz, and the voltage noise of something like 100 picovolt per square root hertz. So really impressive numbers. And this is the, 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 elect this is the, the stack of the electronics in order because you also need filters and so on to get rid of your, of your uh, noise. That we succeed in order to detect individual ions uh, is depicted here. So you see here seven protons stored simultaneously. This is the FTICR signal of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth seventh uh, uh, proton. And now I show you a real-time video that we have imaged in order to see how that develops. Because seven protons are six too many, we need to get rid of them, of six of them, because we always do only single ion experiments. And I let the video run. Oh, now I have to go out of this anyway. Uh, I can't let it run because I'm now in the animation modus, but it doesn't matter. We succeed in order to get rid of six of these individual protons so that we remain with a single proton to determine the cyclotron frequency. A typical apparatus installed here at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg called the Pentatrap experiment that gets used to perform high precision mass measurements on highly charged ions as well as on radioactive species. These are longer lived species and uh, it's a rather complicated apparatus. It's about four meter in length, three meter in height, goes across two floors. The main ingredients are a laser ion source to produce the ion species of interest, an electron beam ion trap to perform the charge treating because we would like to boost the charge state since the cyclotron frequency scales with Q, a transfer beam line, quite a lot of sophisticated electronics, and then a superconducting magnet, which is the core, the heart of our experiment. This part is placed in a, in a dedicated laboratory where we have, for example, temperature stability of something like 10 millikelvin per day in order to get an as perfect magnetic field as possible. With that, uh, I would like to move on to the first results that we have achieved. And as mentioned in the introduction, among others, we were interested in, in the masses of the building blocks of matter, the proton, the electron, and the neutron mass. And the first experiment that we have carried out a few years ago was on the measurement of the proton mass. And as mentioned before, you need to calibrate the magnetic field strength. And in order to do so, you cannot simply use a Hall probe or an NMR probe. Rather, we use a species of interest where the mass is known. And specifically here, we used a 12 carbon 6 plus. As you might know, a 12 carbon, the, the unified atomic mass unit, 1U, is defined via 12 carbon, namely the, the mass of 112 of the mass of carbon 12. And uh, so that makes a, an ideal reference, which has no uncertainty, uh, by the way, except the uncertainty of the binding energies of the six missing electrons. We use the charge state six plus to come as close as possible in Q over M. Still, it's not an, a very good balance because proton has a Q over M of one and the 12 carbon six plus a Q over M of one half. The quantity which we are interested in is the cyclotron frequency of 12 carbon six plus to the proton, correct, as mentioned, corrected for the missing electrons and the binding energy of the electrons. And then you can obtain the proton mass. And we did so in a several weeks a measurement campaign. And you already see here the result. That's the world record measurement of the proton mass with an uncertainty of three times 10 to the minus 11. So if you look right now in the codata table, the compilation of the fundamental constants, you immediately get 
our proton mass value. It's this here, it's an 11 digit, 12 digit number with 15 being the uncertain, the statistical uncertainty and 29 being the systematic uncertainty given by the so-called image charge shift. So the ion sees its own image charge on the surface of the electrodes and gets repelled. And therefore the motion is no longer that harmonic as it should be. And this needs to be corrected for. We then did a very similar experiment with an antiproton at the base experiment, the baryon antibaryon symmetry experiment at CERN in order to perform the CPT, a charge parity time reversal symmetry test. Since we have measured the proton mass, we wanted to compare it to the antiproton mass in a similar way. So we have set up a panning trap system where we can store simultaneously an antiproton as well as an H minus ion. You might think about why we didn't use a proton rather an H minus ion as it is given here because that complicates a little bit exp the experiment as you will see later, but nevertheless, it was the right choice. Remarkable about that experiment is that the temperatures, uh, the, the temperature of liquid helium, so minus 270 degrees centigrade, the vacuum in the apparatus is better than four times 10 to the minus 19 millibar that we know because we have achieved storage times of antiprotons of years. So the longest storage time that we had was two and a half years of a single antiproton in our panning trap. And then we compared the cyclotron frequency ratio of these two species over a couple of weeks. We did more than 6,000 cyclotron frequency ratio measurements. And uh, what is the result? Well, it should be according to CPT symmetry minus one. So the charge to mass ratio of the proton to the antiproton should be minus one. And this is our result published a couple of uh, months ago in Nature. The charge to mass ratio of the antiproton compared to the proton is minus one point, and then comes 11 zeros and the three as the, the deviation from the uh, unity. However, our statistical uncertainty and combined with our systematic uncertainty is 16 on the last digit, so it's in perfect agreement with CPT symmetry. Nevertheless, it's the most stringent test of CPT symmetry in the baryonic sector um, that has been provided here. As mentioned, the experiments or the data analysis is a little bit more complicated because instead of a comparison between the antiproton and the proton, we used an H minus ion. And for the H minus ion, you first have to correct for the two additional electrons. You have to correct for the binding energy of the first electron, the electron affinity of the second electron. And since the two electrons like to uh, uh, have a coherent motion, you also have to correct for the polarizability of the H minus ion. And that we do in a blind data analysis. And only at the very end, when we believe that our data analysis is finished, we open the black box and compare the cyclotron frequencies. And then this final number gets published and the value is given here. What is the limit of the... Uh, of the uncertainty that is given here, this 1.6 times 10 to the minus 11, well, the limit is given by the finite temperature of the antiproton and the proton, namely the environmental temperature of about 4 Kelvin. And, uh, and this causes that the oscillation amplitude of the ion in the trap is still on the order of a couple of microns or a couple of 10 microns, and that accumulates magnetic field homogeneities, which we would like to get rid of. And the idea was born that we do a laser cooling of the species uh, on the proton and antiproton, and similarly on highly charged ions. And that is the work that Bing Sheng Tu, for example, has done in my department, marvelous work to demonstrate that one can do laser cooling of these species, but not direct laser cooling because neither highly charged ions nor the proton or antiproton have a direct laser access because there are no electrons that can be excited in the optical regime. So we came up with the idea to use sympathetic laser cooling, a proposal that has been put forward by Dave Weinand uh, uh, more than 30 years ago, but it took uh, until recently that we demonstrated that it really works. And this is shown in this sketch here. So you have here the penning trap where a proton or a highly charged ion is stored. The laser cooled species is a beryllium ion in our case, which is sitting in a trap next to the proton trap about uh, 10 centimeters apart. And the mediator is a superconducting uh, resonator as it is shown here. 
that transfers the heat or the, the, yeah, the heat from one particle to the other particle. And we succeeded to demonstrate that, that indeed we can cool a single proton or a singly highly charged ion by laser cooling the beryllium species by coupling its motion. So you can think about it as there would be a spring. So this is now my proton, this is my beryllium ion, and the proton is oscillating. And now I do a laser cooling on the beryllium ion. And since they are connected I, as a kind of a, kind of a spring, uh, this cool species now also cools the proton and you still continue the laser cooling here until you have reached thermal equilibrium. And we could demonstrate that we have reached meanwhile a proton axial temperatures of about 100 millikelvin. That's more than a factor of 50 colder than previously that was seen as a top 10 breakthrough in the year 2021 selected by physics for. This is really a major breakthrough because we can now go down in temperature to the yeah, millikelvin or 10, couple of 10 millikelvin regime. With that, uh, I would like to move on to talk about uh, the electron mass, which I mentioned already, but here we have to use a different uh, technique, which uh, where the, the group leader is Sven Sturm shown here. And the idea is to use a bound electron to determine the electron mass. And the bound electron here, the characteristics of this bound electron is the magnetic moment or chi factor, which is a measure for the magnetic strength of this bound electron. And once more, what we are interested in is to relate the quantity of interest, being it the nuclear mass or here the magnetic moment, the chi factor, to a frequency measurement because frequency can be measured with highest precision. And the relating frequency here is the spin precession frequency omega L, also called Lama frequency, given by the chi factor half times the charge to mass ratio of the electron times the B field. And once more, we have the problem that we need a calibration of the magnetic field. How do we do that? Well, by measuring the cyclotron frequency of the particle the electron is attached to, in that case of the 12 carbon nucleus, by the relationship that I have introduced in the first part. So omega C is given by the charge to mass ratio of the ion times B field. And if we measure both frequencies, the cyclotron frequency as well as the Lama frequency simultaneously, the magnetic field cancels out and we get access to this quantity, the G factor. And we have done so by uh, varying then the drive frequency in order to probe the Lama frequency. And you see here, and by that we can flip the spin of the single electron. We can determine whether the spin is up or spin is down. That's exactly the spin transition frequency omega L. And we have succeeded to do so. This is once more a measurement of Bing Sheng 2. We have done so for the case of 118 tin 49 plus. That's the heaviest hydrogen like system ever studied for a G factor measurement in a penning trap. It's a hydrogen like system. You see here this wonderful spin flip resonance from which we can deduce the Lama frequency and then in combination with the cyclotron frequency, then can deduce the G factor and compare this to bound state QED calculations. And the first result that we have done is on 20 neon 9 plus, that's in the light regime. It's hydrogen-like systems of neon. And you see here the amazing agreement between the experimental G factor, it's again a 12-digit number in comparison to the theoretical value, a value that has been uh, calculated by my colleague uh, Soldan Hamann and Christoph Keidel at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics. And you see the amazing agreement within one standard deviations. And this is the most stringent test of bound state QED calculations. Once more, the uncertainty here is in the order of yeah, 1 to 2 times 10 to the minus 11 because of the temperature of the particle. And also here, sympathetic laser cooling would help us a lot. For the heaviest system, we have also done the experiment and compared to theory, but however, here I have to say that theory is much less accurate. And the reason for that is that the scaling of the QED contributions are with set alpha, that being the charge state, and alpha, the fine structure constant, and uh, which is 1 over 137. And the higher you go, here with 49 plus, so set equals 50, set alpha almost becomes 0.5. And now, if you do the, uh, the expansion series, 
set alpha to the second power, to the third power, to the fourth power, to the fifth power, and so on, it becomes very complicated to calculate these higher order terms. And that's the reason why theory is limited here. Nevertheless, this here is the most frequent test of bound state QED and strong fields. Now, how does the electron mass come into play? Well, already here at these levels, the electron mass is a limiting factor. And uh, the idea was born then to go back again to 12 carbon 5 plus and to repeat the experiment. But now, since the nuclear mass is known of 12 carbon, theory can be calculated extremely well because 12 carbon is a spheric nucleus. And the uh, uh, improved sensitivity that we have reached in our experiment allows us to invert the equation that I've just introduced, namely by plugging in now this theory value, so we believe theory is right, plug in our experimental g-factor value, and then the least known quantity is the electron mass. So this is really an inversion of the equation of before, and now the least known quantity is the electron mass, and we repeated that experiment, and we could improve the electron mass a couple of years ago by more than an order of magnitude to the present world best direct measurement. And you see here uh, the relative precision of the electron mass as a function of year over the last 40 years. It improved by almost an order of magnitude per decade. And the latest achievement here is given by us at the value of about 3 times 10 to the minus 11. I like to give the electron mass in units of atomic mass unit because then it becomes a 15 digit number. You simply add a few zeros here, but of course that's not meant so seriously. The uncertainty is at the moment three times 10 to the minus 11. And we plan to repeat the experiment um, rather soon because we believe that we can improve it by another factor of six to eight very soon down to the level of about four times 10 to the minus 12. The, uh, this is now the most precise measurement of the proton mass and the electron mass. And then, of course, how can one get access to the neutron mass in order to determine all building blocks of matter? So the neutron mass we could get access to by measuring the I mean, the neutron is a neutral particle, so you cannot store it in a penning trap. But we can store the, 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 the deut deuterium or the deuteron nucleus which is comprised out of a proton and a neutron and an electron in the outer shell. If we remove the electron, we get a charged particle. And now by measuring the deuteron mass and already knowing the electron mass and the proton mass, and by knowing the binding energy from nuclear physics experiments between the proton and the neutron, you can extract also the neutron mass. We succeeded to improve the deuteron mass by almost a factor of three, uh, published uh, three years ago in Nature, you see here the value that allowed us to improve also the neutron mass by something like 10%, rather little. And the reason for that is that there's still the limiting factor is the binding energy, the nuclear binding energy of the proton and the neutron. So uh, as soon as that can be improved, one immediately gets also the neutron mass improved by up to a factor of three. With that, I would like to move on to the to the second topic of results, namely nuclear masses for neutrino physics, nuclear masses of short-lived radioactive species or longer-lived radioactive species. And here there are three decays that are of uh, specific interest. The first one is the decay of tritium to helium-3 for the cutrin, the cards for tritium neutrino experiment. The, the decay is shown here. So the decay of tritium to helium-3 under the release of an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. And the idea is to get access to the neutrino mass by measuring the decay spectrum of this tritium decay, so the number of events as a function of the released energy taken away by the electron that can be measured in the retardation spectrometer. And the maximum energy that is available in this decay is simply given by the mass difference of tritium to helium-3, which is called the Q value. There are two other decay, uh, sorry, namely the electron capture decay of 163 holmium to dysprosium, which gives you access to the electron neutrino mass, so the antiparticle of the antineutrino. And there's another um, a decay of interest, namely 187 rhenium to 187 osmium, because here the Q value is even smaller 
than the Q value of uh, the tritium decay. And we did an experiment specifically on this last decay by using a radioactive 187 rhenium and uh, measuring the mass differences of rhenium to osmium in highly charged ions. So in order to get the neutral mass difference, you take the mass difference of the highly charged ions, but you have to correct for the binding energy differences of these two species, which is here referred to delta B, and that's a value which we take from theory. To that end, we employed the pentatrap apparatus. It's a penning trap experiment where you have a stack of five penning traps on top of each other. And I would like to introduce why we are using five penning traps on top of each other. Already one penning trap is complicated, two is even more complicated, three is horrible, and we would like to use even five as a stack of penning traps on top of each other. Once more, the reminder, what we're interested in is the cyclotron frequency given by the charge to mass ratio times the B field. And the problem is always the B field since it is not known. The idea is now that we use simultaneously one ion species as a calibrant while we are measuring the cyclotron frequency of the other species. And having these five traps on top of each other, we are using now as an example trap two as the measurement trap and trap one and trap three as storage containers. And that allows us to switch even on a minute scale between these two species that might be rhenium and osmium or tritium or helium-3. And uh, by now repeating that experiment for even days, this allows us to get a probe of the magnetic field by the calibrant and by a polynomial fit to the cyclotron frequency ratios, the magnetic field cancels out. So you get rid of the time dependency of the magnetic field, for example, by flux creep effects. That is nice. You can still argue, well, you have measured at the same position, but still not at the same time. That is correct. Therefore, we are using the third trap. And that allows us now to double our statistics because we can measure cyclotron frequencies in this trap here as well as in this trap. We are measuring at the same position these two species, but we are also measuring time-wise simultaneously between now this one and this one, or a few minutes later between this one and this one. And that allows us to cancel to a very large extent systematic uncertainties, which is a really a unique feature of that apparatus. In the far future, we plan to use the fifth trap as a monitor trap, for example, by storing an electron and measuring the cyclotron frequency of the electron in order to check for time variations of the magnetic field. In this animation, this electron is rather unstable, but I can guarantee later on in the experiment, the motion will be very stable of this electron. But it's not yet in use, the fifth trap. It's implemented, but not yet in use. What did we achieve in the sector of neutrino physics? Here, once more, uh, as a sketch, the five uh, penning traps, we have stored simultaneously rhenium, osmium, rhenium, both in, in the charge state of, of 49 or 46, 47, 48 plus, so highly charged ions. We are measuring for about 30 minutes the frequency ratio. Then we change the position. We simply move ion species one down by one trap, then the second one by one trap, then the third one by one trap. We are using a phase detection method, so no longer measuring frequencies, rather phases. We achieve a storage times of days, but in fact, we exchange the species about once per day, simply to avoid systematic uncertainties. We also change the sequence of ions, not taking rhenium, osmium, rhenium. Sometimes we take osmium, rhenium, osmium, simply to make sure that we do not have any obscure systematic effects. The relative mass precision that we have achieved for this neutrino physics application is six times 10 to the minus 12. That's really amazing because that corresponds to an uncertainty of only a few hundred milli electron volts out of 107, out 187 GeV, which is by far sufficient for neutrino physics application. So this system is now available for neutrino physics research to look for the upper mass limit of the neutrino mass. However, when we carried out the experiment, and I have now to bring a little bit of atomic physics into this uh, colloquium, but this was a really very, very funny effect. When we did the frequency measurements, 
And we, as mentioned before, we reloaded the trap about once per day. We noticed that in about 50% of the cases, we got a frequency ratio given here by R1. And in 50% of the cases, so once over the other day, we got a value which differs significantly, in fact, by about 200 electron volts. And that puzzled us a lot. We thought first about systematic uncertainty, like a two pi mistake in the phase detection method. Then we thought about instabilities and in the temperature stabilization system and so on. But then later on, we did unity measurements between rhenium against rhenium and osmium against osmium. And then we immediately figured out what the problem is. Namely, we produce the ions in the high charge state, here rhenium 29 plus, for example. And if you check carefully the electronic configuration, then it's a krypton-like structure and the filled 4D10 shell. So in the, in the D shell, in the electronic D shell, you can put in 10 electrons there. So this would be the crown state electronic configuration of rhenium 29 plus or osmium 30 plus. However, in the production process in the electron beam ion trap, we have a hot high temperature. It can happen that the electronic configuration ends up in a scheme which is different, namely a 4D9, 4F1 system. So one of the electrons ends up in an F shell. And this is a very, very uh, stable configuration. In fact, the lifetime of this configuration is about a year because it's a highly forbidden transition. This electron here is, uh, needs to have an E5 transition to the ground state. So it's a long-lived metastable electronic state, long-lived for, as said, a year, with an excitation energy of 200 electron volts. So you have now your nucleus attached to a 29 electrons, and one of these electrons can be in an excited state and stays there for days and months and years. And this is a, uh, and, and we were able to, to measure that. So we could really measure excited electronic isomeric states and, uh, and then when we learned about that, we asked our theory colleagues to calculate this excited state without providing them with our number. That was really a blind calculation. And we asked three different groups, the one by Soldan Harman, the one by Paul Indelicato from Paris, and the one by Moritz Habakwart from the University of Heidelberg. He is, in fact, a solid state physicist using density functional theory to calculate binding energy differences. And you see the agreement between our experimental value is just exceptional. I mean, that's at the level of 10 to the minus 12 agreement between experiment and theory. We did the same for osmium 30 plus, and also here is a perfect agreement. And now the application is, is really amazing because with this system now, we can even search for suitable clock transitions. You might know that highly charged ions are discussed as one of the future atomic clocks in order to uh, provide a new time standard. And the reason for that is that uh, many limiting effects like black body radiation are suppressed tremendously in highly charged ions. And uh, the problem is to find suitable um, excited states that can be used as a clock transition. So to give you an example, if this transition here could be used as a clock transition, it can't because the energy of 200 electron volts is not good. But if this state could be used, it would improve the present best clocks by six orders of magnitude from 10 to the minus 18 stability to 10 to the minus 24 because of this long lifetime. And right now we are searching for more of these clock transitions in the energy regime of something like 10 electron volts to 30 electron volts. A very, very um, exciting application that we have found here. Another uh, system that we studied is the decay of holmium. It's a it's a um, electron capture decay, so holmium 163, which needs to produce, be produced at a radioactive beam facility or at a research reactor because it's, it's short lived. It captures an electron to an excited state, nuclear excited state of dysprosium, which then decays to the ground state of uh, dysprosium, and the released energy needs to be measured. And that gets done with metallic magnetic calorimeters. But once more, what is of specific interest here is the Q value. That's the maximum energy that can get released given by the mass difference of holmium to dysprosium. The Q value is around 2.57 keV. And uh, 
many, many groups have looked into that Q value for the last uh, 40 years with varying uncertainties, with uh, varying Q values, because the nuclear physics part was rather complicated here. And uh, we provided the first result about eight years ago with an uncertainty of 30 electron volts, uh, different by more than five standard deviations to that at that time. Um, uh, literature value, ex uh, uh, accepted literature value that was repeated by this metallic magnetic calorimetry measurement in perfect agreement. And we just finished last year a new measurement where we improved the Q value by another factor of 50 and we have now an uncertainty of 0.6 electron volt. That's the highest precision ever achieved of about four times 10 to the minus 12 in the mass differences of holmium to dysprosium for neutrino physics applications. With that, in the last five minutes, I would like to move on to another application of this nuclear mass measurements. So you can see that now the nuclear physics part of my group really stretches out towards atomic physics. Uh, towards neutrino physics and now even towards uh, dark matter search or nuclear masses for fifth force search. And uh, the idea is here to uh, use laser spectroscopy, namely isotope shift spectroscopy, in order to search for fifth force. How does that come into play? Well, I will be brief here. The isotopic shift between two electronic transitions can be probed by laser spectroscopy, and it's a uh, it consists of two terms, and one term is related to the mass differences, and the other one to the charge radii differences. And if you plot two different transitions against each other, one assumes, according to King, a linearity, which is called King plot. So all of the isotopic shifts should line up here on a single line. And now, of course, you can change the... Uh, the, uh, the force by adding a, a scalar field uh, that couples only to the neutrons, but not to the protons. And then your uh, king plot would uh, modify by this um, coupling uh, parameter alpha here, which scales with the mass difference of the, of the species. And what you would see is a variation or a deviation from this linearity. That's what people are interested in. We are not doing this laser spectroscopy part, but what we are doing is the mass measurement part, because as mentioned before, the second term here is given by the mass differences of the species involved. And uh, that, those needs to be known to very high precision. Uh, this slide is very crowded, I know. I just would like to emphasize what are the present best candidates to search for such a fifth force. This is the isotopic chain of ytterbium because you need minimum four even even isotopes in order to avoid nuclear structure or to avoid uh, hyperfine structure effects. So these are the ytterbium isotopic chain. A very prominent isotopic chain is calcium, calcium 40, 42, 44, 46, and 48. These are five stable even even isotopes, two of them even doubly matched with a closed proton and neutron shell, namely 40 and 48. And the other, the third very prominent uh, chain is the strontium isotopic chain with 84, 86, 88, and 90 strontium with the complexity that 90 strontium is a short-lived species. And once more, we need to measure the nuclear mass of 90 strontium to an uncertainty of 5 times 10 to the minus 12. Very complicated experiment. Nevertheless, we did a demonstration experiment by measuring the isotopes of xenon. They can't be used for fifth force search because there are no laser spectroscopic data available, but we used it as a proof of principle experiment that we can even measure isotopic masses of isotopic chains. Although some of these species have abundances of only 0.1%, so uh, 9, 0.9 per mil even. And uh, nevertheless, we succeeded to measure the stable species of uh, xenon 126, 128, 130, 132, 134, and we are going to measure even the unstable species of xenon 127 and 133, 133 xenon, which we need to do at an online facility, for example, at, at ISOL at CERN. And you see here our, our mass uncertainties compared to the literature value. We improved the literature value partly by more than three orders of magnitude, so the uncertainty here on 126 xenon has been uh, several keV 
while our uncertainty is this blue bar here, which is in the order of one electron volt. So this is a factor of 1,700 more accurate. And we did so for the whole isotopic chain. And by that, we could demonstrate that we can even provide nuclear masses for fifth force search or dark matter search, which is one of our future fields of applications by measuring the isotopic chains of calcium, strontium, and deuterium. With that, I'm at the end. I hope I could show you that precision penning graph mass spectrometry has reached an amazing precision on exotic systems, being a short-lived radioactive nuclides for neutrino physics applications, for nuclear structure physics applications, being at the antiproton for a test of CPT symmetry, or by using highly charged ions as exotic species, for example, to do research on the finding of new clock transitions, and you have seen the multifold of applications. With that, thanks a lot for the invitation and your attention, but I would like to conclude also by a big, big thank you to my division and team members, specifically also to Bing Sheng Tu, who has done amazing work at the department. I have shown two of his results. There are more to come because we still stay in close collaboration. This is during a hiking tour last year in the marvelous summer in Heidelberg. And uh, once more, thanks a lot for the invitation and your attention, and I'm looking forward to receive your questions. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Carl. Wonderful talk, and uh, that reveals the application of penetration mass uh, spectrometer in the research of like uh, probing fundamental waves and uh, determining the, the fundamental constant and uh, uh, searching for some uh, new fix even this source. Okay, great. Uh, if the audience like the uh, talk, you can uh, Give a plot in the action part. Okay, now it's for the question. Any questions online or here? Okay, uh, Kahan from FJTU, you can unmute your voice. I think you can. Okay, now you can. Uh, hi, yes. Hi, may I ask a question about uh, the Mass difference measurement between uranium and osmium. So, yeah, there is a dirt B there as a binding energy, energy difference. How accurate in that part? Ah, very good question. Yeah, thanks. Very good question. Indeed. So, uh, the question relates to this equation here. Since for neutrino physics, you need to know the atomic mass differences, but we can only measure the mass differences of ionic species or highly charged ions. So you have to correct, you do not have to correct for the total binding energy difference, but you have to correct for the, uh, not for the total binding energy, but for the binding energy differences. And that can be calculated to about 0.5 electron volts. So this is uh, given here in this uncertainty. So the Solgan Harman has calculated this uncertainty of 0.5 electron volts is mainly coming from the uncertainty in the binding energy differences. Uh, Moritz Habakkuk has achieved 0.4 electron volts and Paul Indelicato 2.7 electron volts. And the, the main difference is that uh, Harman and Indelicato are using somewhat the same technique, but Soldan Harman calculated one higher, one more order in set alpha expansion. So it's about 1 to 0.5 electron volts uncertainty in delta B. Okay, thanks. So maybe related to the next measurement is uh, the homium. That uh, uncertainty is uh, 0.6. Is yeah. this uh, limited by the similar absolutely. fact? Yeah, absolutely right, uh, Kehan. Also, this value is limited by by the theory. The experimental uncertainty had been has been or is 0.2 electron volts in delta Q. But the CAV uncertainty is 0.6 electron volts. So indeed, here also the limiting factor is theory. So um, whoever can improve theory would help us a lot because experiment is right at this moment a factor of three to five ahead of theory. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Thanks, Kehan. Okay, next, uh, Shabayang. Okay, now okay. okay. Hello, Klaus. Hi, Chopin. Good Hi, to see you. <laughs> it's first time I see, see your slides in a different field. So I have a few small questions. Why is it related to this uh, metastable state on the krypton? 
do you really see the uh, year's half life of this metastable state in your uh -huh. pioneer trial? Oh, yeah, very good question. Uh, indeed, the the lifetime is calculated. It's so okay. long that we can't see it because we store our ions only for a couple of days. So we cannot okay. see how long the lifetime is. But that would be a wonderful measurement. And I think Bing Sheng is going to develop such a technique. If one could measure in situ the lifetime of excited states. Uh, so in fact, if the lifetime would be in the order of only a few hours or so, one would see in our experiment that the excited electronic states decays to the ground state because that would yeah. correspond to a shift in the cyclotron frequency because there's a yeah. change in mass. Yes, and yes. We, we have not seen that. I have to be specific here. We did not see that. So the, the, the lifetime of, of about a year is a calculation by Paul and Delicato. It's okay. an estimate. Okay, the, the second question related to the, the dark matter search for the chem plot. So you yeah. mentioned about three isotopic chains, but uh, is there any specific reason for this? Only the three spec three isotopic chain because there's also other even even isotopes, oh, what, many what, many stables. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wonderful, Chao Fei, and uh, maybe I can motivate you since you are one of the experts in, in the laser spectroscopy part to go into the future into this high precision uh, isotopic shift measurement. That would be wonderful. Yes. The reason why the, uh, these are, so first of all, you need minimum four even even isotopes. That already limits uh, the, the species to about 10 or so. The next is yeah. that you would like that you need to know the nuclear structure part. And the reason for that is that this linearity here in the King plot assumes that there are no higher order terms. For example, octopolar deformed nuclei would not be good. Because oh, that could okay. also, so in fact, my personal opinion here is that whenever we see a first deviation from the linearity, it's not a fifth force. It's, to my opinion, most likely a nuclear structure effect, like, for example, an octopolar deformation. Okay. Is that also the first radial moment also can affect this? For example, in, if there's some neutron skin, this will be add to the first radial moment. That's a structure effect, right? Absolutely. 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 So right at this moment, the most prominent chains are therefore ytterbium, calcium, and strontium, and uh, probably also barium. From the nuclear okay. physics point of view, the most interesting chain would be tin. Yes. Because That's tin is, uh, is a very long chain with six or yeah. seven even, even isotopes, can yeah. be spectroscopically very well studied. And I proposed that about a year ago to my colleagues, and another topic is that you need clock transitions here. I mean, you see here uh, the isotopic shift, you need an uncertainty of 100 millihertz. That's very, yeah. very complicated to achieve, 100 millihertz. And yeah. so you need a very good optical transitions, clock transitions in these species. And right now, groups are developing one for tin as well. So tin would be a marvelous chain. I see. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you, Jope. Nice to see you here. Okay, thanks, Jofei. And next question from um, Regine Chen. Wait a minute. Hello. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear. We can hear you. Yes, a uh, very nice talk. I want to ask you one question. Is it, po uh, is it possible to carry out a robust day beta decay experiment of Talian 205 in, in, in Penetrap? I think your solution is good enough to resolve the uh, how to say, in a mother ion and a doctor ions. If uh, we... what, what wonderful question. Indeed. Uh, can you remind me on the lifetime? On the lifetime is about one year. That is where, where the problem is. So in principle, you are right. The resolution is good enough to see it, uh, by far good enough. The problem is, if you have a lifetime of a year or so, it would simply... Uh, since we are only doing single ion experiments, it's not that we store a cloud of ions. If you could store a thousand ions, and uh, then of course you would have a decay once in a while, uh, but our detection scheme is set up that we only want to see a single ion at a time. And then if you have a one year lifetime, it simply takes too long to carry out such an experiment. 
So we would be rather interested in going to a, a case which are on a scale of a few hours to at most uh, a few days. But why, why we can only measure one single ion? I mean, is it possible to increase ion number inside the penetrator? trial? Uh, we, we could. We, we could. So first of all, the, there's a so-called Brunner limit uh, by, the, by the density. So we cool the particles to a volume of uh, a, a few couple of cubic micrometers. Uh, so uh, the number of particles you can store in there is, is rather limited. If you, if you put more particles in, more charges, keep in mind these are highly charged ions, then the cloud would get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you would accumulate inhomogeneities. And then inner inhomogeneity would cause, let me go to one of the spectra. Uh, where is it? Was at the beginning here, right. So uh, if we have more ions in, so right now we... Uh, we have here seven, if we cool them, they appear, and then the, the resonance gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then we lose resolution. So I would say, right at this moment, we could easily handle 10 ions at a time. But if you are asking to go up to 100 or so, this detection scheme would not work any longer to resolve single ions. Okay, I see. But it doesn't mean that, uh, okay, I see. Okay, thank you. We would have to modify the trap. We could build a bigger trap. So you're, in principle, you're right. It's a technical question. It, it would work. I'm quite convinced it would work. We could go up to 1,000 ions or so. But the, the way the experiments are designed right at this moment, it's more like that we do experiments on single ions or at most a few ions. Mm. I say thank you. Welcome. OK, next question from Shingo Ma. Okay, Klaus, great talk. So my first question is uh, for the, uh, the QED test in strong field, the defect measurements compared to the transition energy measurement, which is more sensitive? That's a wonderful, that's a wonderful question, uh, uh, Wen. Right at this moment, uh, it's the G factor which is most sensitive. But uh, indeed, we might end up at some moment, if we can improve on the binding energy, what we are thinking about is uh, to, to measure even uh, lamp shifts at some yeah. moment, go to the very high uh, charge states. So hydrogen-like uh, LED, for example, we are setting up an EBIT to go for hydrogen-like LED. Then this might become the most sensitive tests. Uh, right now, it's, it's the, uh, the case of, of, of neon, which is uh, more or less the most sensitive test to QED calculations. It's not yet the binding energy. Uh, yeah. So uh, actually, my, my question is, uh, theoretically, which is more sensitive? What is the sensitivity? Oh, uh, theoretically? Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer, to be honest, Chen uh -huh. I don't know okay. the answer. Okay. I, I, I come to my second question, maybe. Yeah. Uh, in your this, uh, this trap, uh, when you uh, trap three ions, uh, the the all in high charge states. Uh, so you because your measurements are so accuracy. So what are the couplings of these ions of the charge? Do they have any effects to the measurements? Okay, what, what was the question? The, the charge, the charge couplings of these three ions. Oh, because they okay. are in high charge states. Right. Yeah, excellent. The, the reason why we store them in different traps is exactly because of the charge coupling. If we would store them in the same trap, and we have done so in the case of 20 neon line 9 plus, we also stored a second 22 neon 9 plus, and we could put them on the same magnetron orbit because of the charge coupling. So they form a kind of an ion crystal in the trap. And yeah. in order to avoid that, we put here the trap. So the traps are about uh, four centimeters apart from each other. And uh, so the distance is big enough that we do not see an effect of the charge coupling between these highly charged ions. But indeed, as soon as we bring them together in a single trap, we immediately see the charge coupling on the same macrochrome orbit where they form a kind of an ionic crystal. Mm -hmm. oh, I yeah. see. So we on, on, on purpose, we moved to this 
uh, five trap configuration in order to not limit our uncertainty by the coupling. The coupling, if they would be in the same trap, the uncertainty would be already limited to about uh, 10 to the minus, a few times 10 to the minus 10, between 10 to the minus 9 and 10 to the minus 10. Oh, I see. Yeah, that would cause an, 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 yeah, a charge effect, which we could not correct for, because they have a deviating uh, cyclotron frequency at the level of 5 times 10 to the minus 10, around 1 times 10 to the minus 9. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, for the third question, I didn't get uh, get the uh, number of the lifetime for this uh, uh, Relam twenty nine. This uh, this configuration for forty nine forty nine F one. What's the yeah. number? Uh, the 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 lifetime. I mean. Yeah, the, the lifetime is about one year. That was calculated by Paul in Delicato. Uh, namely, you get a quenching because of the B field. Ah, uh, one year. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. one year. It's, it's. I think it's the calculation is three hundred and twenty days. Three hundred and twenty days, and that okay. is uh, with an uncertainty of of twenty or thirty days, and uh, and it, it, it's 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 not it's infinite lifetime because of the magnetic field quenching. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chen Wen. Thanks, Ching Ma. And the uh, next question from um, Oh, wait. Wait a minute. <laughs> Sorry, I can't unmute it. Oh, no, you can. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes, very nice talks. I just have uh, only one question about uh, the measurement of G factors. So does the uh, bounding energy, the accuracy of the bounding energies uh, influence the measurement of the G factors? How much is it? Yeah. So uh, in the case of, um, of the light systems like 12 carbon or 20 neon 9 plus, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. because the binding energies are known to uh, below or uh, around milli electron volt uncertainty. So that doesn't cause any problem here. Going to the very heavy systems like uh, 1049 plus, uh, then it starts to, to become a problem. Well, for the G factors, not because you're measuring the G factor in the specific state, but for the um, um, for the for the neutral masses and so on, then it, it causes a problem. Indeed, there there the uncertainties are then already in the order of electron volts. Yeah, so for light systems up to um, z equals twenty, it's not a problem. The uh, charge, the the binding energy of the electrons are well known enough. But if you go to heavier systems, it gets more and more problematic. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jen Green. And now next question from Regin again. Uh, sorry, close wrong. I I I I I have question uh, about the. Is it possible laser as a detector to measure the uh, topped ion in the in the bound state beta decay of talent O five? I mean, is it, you know that in bound state beta decay of talent O five. Ion, it is lead 205 and the hydrogen don't like lead 205. If this ion can generate a metal state and we know the frequency of this metal state, then we use a laser to excite it and we, we, we detect the laser intensity, the absorption laser intensity. I, I don't know, maybe the laser intensity and the least laser intensity will be sensitive to the ion. We can count the uh, dark ion. Is it possible to? Perform experiment in this way that we can precisely measure the doctor ion all the time. So we don't use shot key, but we use laser. Well, but 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 you need an, an, a, tra a transition for the laser. Yes. In, in a storage ring that works because you have the, the so-called gamma boost, namely that you have the highly rel relativistic particle. You have your laser at uh, optical wavelength and you get the gamma boost so that the energy matches. In a penning graph, that's not possible because in a penning graph, you would need a laser 
with an energy regime of a couple of hundred electron volts or so. So it's simply not possible in a, in a panning prep to do it. In a storage ring, it might be possible because of the gamma boost. Okay, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Bing Cheng, there's a question in the chat. Maybe I read it. Yes, I see. Can you see it? Yeah, hi, Professor. I want to ask is... no. <laughs> okay. I hi, Professor. I want to ask a question about the detection of the cyclotron frequency of a proton or an electron in penning graph. I know that the frequency of the electron's classical axial oscillation, which we could detect use a LC circuit, but what could we do to detect the cyclotron frequency? Is there a formula to calculate the cyclotron frequency using the experimental data or use an LC circuit? In fact, that's exactly how it gets done. Uh, we are using an LC circuit. I get back to the, or maybe I misunderstood the question, but it's exactly that what, it, what gets done here. This is more or less an LC circuit. So the, uh, the L is the coil, the inductivity of this coil here. The C is the parasitic capacitance, which is the capacitance between the trapped electrodes. And in fact, it's an LCR circuit because there is here also a, a real resistor. And, uh, and then you measure the, uh, the, the amplified. And in fact, um, if you would make this spectrum here broader, you would, you would see the LCR resonance as a broad resonance, which uh, gives you the main amplification. And then on top of this LCR resonance, you see the single ion uh, frequencies. So exactly what you have described is the way we are going to detect the ions. I think I answered the question. Because I have one question uh, about, um, uh, could you briefly introduce or give a review or even give a perspective on the utilizing of Pentrap to do like uh, uh, mass measurement of um, radioactive, like short wave utilized like super heavy elements? So can you do that? Because I think the, the audience from some some are uh, uh, quite interesting that like, like, like uh, ship trap doing, what ship trap doing, yeah. Right. So, right at this moment, um, well, the, the only experiment that, uh, that does as a penning trap experiment, you might also use the MR TOF um, technique, the only penning trap that uh, is installed at the radioactive ion beam facility that can produce heavy and super heavy elements is the ship trap facility. They have succeeded oh, to measure, they have succeeded to measure. Again? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, that's the noise. Oh, background noise. Okay. So the, uh, they have succeeded to measure the masses of, of, uh, of uh, francium, uh, for example, neptunium, and so on, at the level of, of 10 to the minus uh, 7 and 8. Then there was the idea to use also the FDICR technique to improve that. But then the phase imaging technique came into play that we have developed about uh, eight years ago where you can imprint the face of the ion in the penning trap on a detector. And by that, it was possible to measure even down to 10 to the minus 9 uncertainty, even for very short-lived species. We have done a measurement of a radionuclide with a half-life of 100 milliseconds at the level of 10 to the minus 10. So um, I think the way to go is to use this PIICR technique and... Uh, and right at this moment, as said, the limit is at about uh, production rate of one particle per day or one particle every few hours. And, um, and that's at the ship trap facility. Okay. Uh, could you uh, similarly um, uh, 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 explain the, the limit of the lifetime of the short nuclear the pen trap can do? Like 10 milliseconds or one millisecond? Yeah. The, the limit on the Schottky detection, I would guess, at, at the moment in our experiments, is in the order of uh, a couple of seconds. So we need a lifetime oh, of at least a, a, a couple of seconds. Okay, so if any nuclei uh, short of the lifetime then is shorter than a couple of seconds, you cannot yeah. do by pen and At, at some moment, there, there's a trade off. In fact, I don't. For, for most, if you have really a short-lived radioactive species, the, most of the applications, being it in nuclear structure physics or so, require only an uncertainty in the order of 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 9. That might, for example, be a test of, of uh, weak interaction. 
that might be a test of the conserved vector current hypothesis or a test of the CKM unitarity. And the 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 9 can be easily reached with the destructive detection technique. So I would not implement a non-destructive detection technique. It's simply too complicated. There are now other techniques which are much easier and better suited. Okay. Any questions from the audience online or somewhere in the chat or? Of course, if you have later okay. questions, you can also address them <laughs> to Bing Sheng. Bing Sheng might pass it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, otherwise, I'm, I'm looking forward to meet you all at some moment uh, again in uh, in in, sure, Nassau, sure. in in Beijing, um, in Fudan, or wherever. Yeah, Nanjing or, or Huizhou. Yeah, yeah. We, we we would be very looking forward to to see you really face to face this year, second half of this year, maybe uh, sometime. Yeah. Okay, now since there's no question anymore, let's thank the speakers again. And uh, thank you very much, Klaus. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot, Bing Sheng. Thanks a lot to the audience. Uh, thanks a lot to my great colleagues uh, in China, uh, Zhao Fei, Jin uh, Wen, and so on. It was nice seeing you and hope to see you soon again in person. Would be my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you very much.